Welcome to the uh, final series in the Rewired series, Show the Blend. For the last uh, couple of months since October, we've talked about blended learning here in the Columbia classroom. Um, and we started off thinking about Brent Stockwell's class where he looked at ways to blend his biochemistry class um, using audience response systems and using some group work and some peer uh, teaching as well as just-in-time feedback. We then took each week as an opportunity to think about how uh, the parts of Brian's class and the parts of other you know, proven blended learning uh, classes here at Columbia uh, could be thought about in the context of your own teaching. So we looked at activating the classroom, creating presentations, uh, we talked about discussion, we talked about inquiry-based learning, and then we finally thought about how can you assess all of this and know uh, whether or not what you've been trying has been working. Um, so the series is put on by the Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, we are a group of 30 plus faculty, or sorry, faculty professional developers. Uh, you know, through programs, services, and resources, we help professionally develop faculty here at Columbia. Um, and I also want to point out that for those of you that came to four or more sessions uh, before the showcase, we've been talking about a gift, right? We've been talking about a little certificate of participation. It's over there, and it'll be the last thing that we hand out after everything is done. So uh, hopefully, you know, it will be a, a nice way to celebrate at the end. In the spring of 2017, we're going to have another series of workshops, right? So those dates will be up. We're looking to introduce some other topics. Um, so there'll be some different topics. Uh, so definitely keep a, an eye out for the spring 2017 schedule for Wired. Today's session, Show the Blend, I have three faculty who um, have come to share their experiences with using technology uh, you know, in a blended way in the classroom. We have Jason, who's Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. We have Sarah, who's a chemistry professor. And we have Marianne Price, who's in the biological sciences. Um, so we're going to really hear from them the majority of today you know they're going to talk for about 15 minutes there'll be time for you to ask questions all right so let's go ahead and get started with jason so i'm going to bring up jason here all right so as i mentioned i actually um one of the hats i wear at the university is as co-director of the undergraduate program in sustainable development which is the program in which i teach the class i'll be telling you about the reason uh, I think this is relevant is because if you don't know what sustainable development is, you can count yourselves in the majority, uh, certainly with regard to the students who we recruit into our program. Um, I like to think of sustainable development as the natural and social sciences at the intersection of 21st century challenges. And the reason why this is relevant uh, in the context of what I want to tell you about is it's an interdisciplinary field. It's a new um, major and special concentration. The former was offered in 2010 and the latter was offered in 2007. And so there's a lot that we do to educate our students about what sustainable development is, the different forms it can take, and to teach them about the kind of interdis interdisciplinary paths they can take to our program. And in the spirit of that, one of the foundational courses that are required within our program is this course that I'm going to tell you about, the Introduction to Sustainable Development. Uh, this is taken from the syllabus. It was originally presented, or we decided to, um, to teach the course originally, to really teach the students about the program. Because it was so new, the idea behind this course was actually to tell them more about the kinds of requirements and the kinds of things that they could do within the program. I should mention it's a one credit class. It's a seminar-based course uh, that in which we have these discussions in part about what the program is and what the requirements are. I started teaching the class in 2011, and one of the things that I felt was, was important moving forward was really to evolve the class beyond just telling the students about our program, but actually give them a sort of 30,000-foot view of what sustainable development is and have a discussion with the students in the seminar format. Uh, more along the lines of the bolded section here, which is really to explore the breadth of the, the subject matter and the multidisciplinary nature of the scholarship. And so that's how the course has evolved. We do much less uh, discussions of what the specific requirements are within our program and take this, this larger view of what it means uh, as an academic discipline. Just to give you a, a, a sense of the kind of goals and the structure of the class, um, we cover 
sort of the historical context for this discussion, how we define and measure sustainable development, uh, how we think it will evolve into the future, consider criticisms of sustainable development, and then also in this latter part is where uh, we talk about our program, but also do it more in an introspective way about what the students think is important about educating for sustainable development and what kinds of career paths they might consider within that. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the original motivations are still addressed. Uh, we like to use this class as a chance to fam familiarize the students with the program, uh, how it fits into the larger Earth Institute activities. I should say that this is the only undergraduate degree that's offered within the Earth Institute. Uh, and consider what they might do with the degree in sustainable development. And because this is a very large interdisciplinary program, we have about 140 to 150 declared special concentrators and majors at any given time. It's also a chance to build community among the students and, and actually familiarize the students with their, with their respective peers. And so it's an important community building um, experience as well. Uh, I should say, just stepping back, for those of you who are in departments or, or thinking about uh, your next career steps potentially into departments, one of the things that's worthwhile, and I've talked to a lot of people just about this intro course format. I should mention again, it's a one credit class. It's um, very conversation and, and seminar based. But it's a great chance to actually consider the subject matter within your department and give the students a large overview of what it entails as a, as a, as a subject, what they might do with it, the ways in which they might move forward if they decide to major in your program. So essentially as a, as a recruitment tool, and I think in talking with a lot of the students, for those who take this class very early, uh, it actually is very important for encouraging students to take the major and, and be involved with sustainable development as a potential um, academic path. So it's worked very well for us. And I've talked with other departments about how this model might be effective in their departments as well. And so it's something to consider. I'd be happy to follow up with more discussion about that if you have questions. So what I want to do <clears throat> in the context of this blended course uh, subject today is talk to you about the two course tools that uh, I use in this class that I consider to be very helpful. I should mention I've been doing this class now for about five years and using Edblogs. Everyone knows what Edblogs is, right? So I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more background on it, but it's actually a real pleasure to be talking about it here because I've been working with Paul to uh, use this in my course since I began teaching it and uh, it's fun to be here sort of proselytizing about its effectiveness. Uh, and I assume that you're familiar with iClickers or other audience response tools. Um, and I use these both in my classroom. And, and what I'd like to show you just through a couple quick examples, given the time that we have, is how it really feeds into a lot of these uh, concepts that you guys have been talking about in this course, from flipped classrooms and blended learning to these different aspects of meaningful learning and the motivating subjects that you've used to really organize this course, how I see these as blending, activating, and driving, and collaborating. Uh, in, in my course. So the way I want to do that is just through example, but I'm going to give you a very quick uh, run through of what the blog looks like, the kind of environment that uh, we use. So this is the, I don't know how well you can see this, but these tabs here, I do everything through Edblogs. In fact, I use course uh, tools very uh, modestly, actually. The syllabus is listed here. Uh, I also include things like the major and special concentration requirements. But most of the action is through the Assignments tab here. This is an example of assignment uh, that I assign in the sixth week. Some other things that are useful, these are the students' names have been re removed here, but you, have, you can click on each of the individual students and find out where they've uh, completed assignments and put posts, as well as where they've commented on other people's posts. Uh, there's lots of different organizational aspects. You can organize things in categories. I do that by assignment. The students can include tabs and so on. The, the front page essentially looks, if you go to the home page, it's just a running, um, just like any blog that you're familiar with, each of the students posts sort of are a running timeline of when they, when they post them and so on. It's a great environment. If you, if you, it's very easy to use. I should mention once it's set up and once you're familiar with it, uh, it's very easy to use. It does change on a fairly regular basis, which is good to have CTL to help you uh, with any kind of... Uh, logistical concerns, but they're very uh, responsive and it's been fantastic to use it and I, I have enjoyed the improvements over the years. Um, so what I want to talk most about is, is the way that the blog assignments work within the class, which is really the way that I use the, the Edblog system to really flip and, and blend the classroom. So almost all the assignments are structured this way. Uh, I assign some form of reading or some multimedia content on the blog that the students are asked to review. 
this is a one credit class, so one of the things to consider is to minimize, it, it's actually fairly, um, it takes a lot of work to find material that's short and contained enough that will feed a, a valuable discussion, but not be too much work for these students who are taking this class for one credit. And so that's definitely something that uh, I'm always mindful of. So once they've uh, reviewed that material, they write a blog post driven by the content and an assigned question or reflection. So that's posted then at the blog. And then one of the interacting aspects of it is that once they've made a post, they're expected to write comments on other peers' posts as part of their assignment. So there's a schedule to this. They're usually asked to write their post by Friday. And then by the day before class, they're asked to complete these comments on other posts to de describe peer-to-peer -peer interaction on the blog. And then I do lots of different things to bring the blog content into the lecture format or the, the discussion format the following day. So all of the content is aimed at what we're going to be talking about in the subsequent class period. And so this is sort of the setup and how this content then gets folded in. Maybe an example is the most effective thing. And so I just want to read through uh, a quick assignment. I'll just highlight, this is basically the assignment that the students are asked to complete with regard to criticisms of sustainable development. So you can, this, is, this article here is actually linked, but they're assigned an article, article voicing three areas of criticism of sustainable development. The students are then asked to write a criticism of their own. So reflect on the article, but then come up with something that might be related to the content, but also can be their own criticism of sustainable development. And then their comments, what they're asked to do is take the, the opposing perspective. So to defend sustainable development against the criticism that that given student wrote in their blog post. And so already this is doing a lot of things from this, this meaningful learning schematic that's certainly um, driving discussion. It's collaborative in the sense that the students are interacting. I mean, this is very uh, intentional to get the students to basically put out criticisms and then defend against those criticisms among their peers. And I'll talk about some of the other things that I think this is effective for doing. Uh, the way that this then gets pulled into the classroom is, as I mentioned, the, the article is split into to three criticisms. So I split the students up into six groups. Three of those groups are tasked with articulating one of those criticisms and coming up with a collective uh, criticism from that area. The other three groups are then asked to come up with defenses of that criticism. And so once all of that is done, each group voices their, their assignment. So if they were uh, assigned to voice a criticism, they're asked to do that. And then the, the group that is defending against that criticism is asked to voice their opinion. Then those arguments from each of the subjects are discussed by the class um, once those have been presented. And so this is one way in which I try to pull those blog assignments back into the classroom. Other ways might involve actually posting, showing posts from the blog and asking the students to evaluate uh, the blog post in the context of the assignment, what it includes, what it doesn't include, how they feel about that particular uh, response in the context of the assignment. So this is used to pull that uh, activity back into the classroom and also really motivate a discussion around something that the students have already essentially uh, written and, and certainly the students whose uh, writings are included feel some ownership over the perspectives that are given. So this is also where the, the eye clickers and the audience response tools really come in. So within this context of the criticisms of sustainable development, one of the things that we do is before all of the responses are communicated in the classroom, I survey the students with the eye clickers and ask uh, them to identify where they fall, whether they find the criticism of sustainable development in that particular category or the defense of it most uh, convincing. And then I ask them the same question after the groups have presented and the discussion has occurred. And it's a, it's a great way of reflecting back to the class uh, attitudes that people have about these criticisms. Uh, it certainly motivates discussions. It gives me a chance to ask, for instance, if these responses change after the discussion has been, uh, has been had, uh, what kinds of things motivated the students to change their mind. I assume that you, in, if you're familiar with iClickers, it's, it's an anonymous, real-time uh, survey system, and you can display the responses of those surveys immediately. And so after a question like this, it's very easy to display the bar chart uh, characterizing the responses. 
So that's, that's an example of how I use the blogs in combination with the eye clickers. There's lots of different ways that you can use eye clickers. I'm sure many of you have thought about it. This is just one other example of something that's sort of independent of the blog. This was related to an assignment. But another way in which I find the eye clicker is really useful to use is if you have survey data from studies, it's, it's I think, very instructive to cast those uh, surveys to the students first. So this is an example of a question that I ask the students and ask for their responses through the eye clickers. I get their responses on this survey first, and then it can be compared to, for instance, surveys that uh, I've taken from the literature. So this is an example of the response of sustainability experts to the question I just showed you and how they break out in terms of what their thinking is uh, regarding the impediments to sustainable development. And it's, I think, a very motivating example for asking students why their responses might look like these expert responses or why they might look different and why they chose what they did. And so there's lots of opportunities for using eye clickers. I think there's lots more ways in which I could use them more effectively, but this is just another example of what we do. I want to just talk about the benefits and the challenges that I've experienced in using these tools. First of all, as far as the benefits using ed blogs and eye clickers, uh, I would simply say that all of these things that you are thinking about in the context of this class, I think are achieved with these kinds of uh, technology applications. I really like how it fosters discussion beyond the classroom and motivates the discussion that we then have. There's a tremendous opportunity for uh, increasing peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange on the blog. I think it really enhances the efforts on the assignments because all the students are viewing each other's assignments. And I, my impression is that actually improves the amount of effort they put into these assignments. Uh, I think I get more informed discussions in class because they've already done the work. It, in, in my opinion, increases in class participation. And I really think from the perspective of the eye clickers and these student response tools, there's a lot of value in immediately reflect, reflecting back to the class what the class collectively thinks. And sometimes it's really counter to what you might imagine. I just had a discussion last week with my students about the election, and it was really interesting to show the sort of thinking of the class back to the class in terms of what people's thoughts were about various aspects of the election. So it's, it, there's some real value in showing the class collectively how they're thinking. Some of the challenges that I've run into, I would love for there to be a more interactive dialogue on the blog. There's this sort of intentional post and then comments, but I'm not getting as much sort of follow-up. The, obviously, they have to do this for their assignments and place uh, two comments on the blog. There's some cases in which there's continuing dialogue beyond that, but I find that in many cases, this is sort of where it ends. They're asked to put a post up and then two comments. I think there's always better ways to pull those blog assignments back into class. I've sort of worked on it over the years. I gave you one example, but there's lots of ideas for how to better do that. I would love for the space to be, this is actually a technical issue with, with uh, ed blogs, but I think there's a lot of, this might be improved, the, the dialogue between students, if there was space for current events uh, and sort of related content to be more actively discussed. I have a tab, but it sort of gets relegated to another part of the blog that the students don't go to. They will post things on current events at the top of the blog roll, but once more things get posted, it sort of gets lost to the bottom. And so I think that's a, a challenge for thinking about how we might improve the edblog space. I would love to have more multimedia content, even uh, in this context with, a, with an online resource. A lot of it's just direct reading. A few assignments I have, TED Talks and so on, but I would love to fold more multimedia content into the assignments. And this is more of a Columbia thing, uh, but it's interesting trying to, to do these blended uh, flipped classroom things often involve a lot of group work and classroom arrangements are really important. And as much as we've really improved this online technology that allows us to do these things, oftentimes we get assigned to classrooms that completely are not up to speed or up to par in encouraging the kind of group work that could be done off of these blog spaces. And so they often fix classrooms. It's very hard to manipulate uh, the classroom into groups and have collective uh, learning in that way. And so that's a sort of infrastructure challenge, but it's definitely something that is difficult in this context. All right. I'm happy to follow up with questions if you guys have uh, anything that you'd like to know. How am I, am I done on time, or is that about it? Is there one or two quick questions? Yes. So I cap it at 40. The first year I taught it, there were 70 students, and it was terrible for group work and, and these kinds of uh, discussion-based assignments. So I cap it at 40, and that's a decent size. It's, that cap is part to foster the, the group work that we try to do in class, 
but also to address the needs of the program because this is a required foundational course. I teach it in both semesters and 40 students in each class basically serves that need. <clears throat> yeah? How do you group the students? How do I group the students? Yes. I mean, randomly, uh, will you conduct a student survey if they tend to have a positive attitude towards um, sustain, sustainable development and you right. put in the group of defense or something? So for the assignment that I showed you, it's largely random and I kind of like the idea of them having to take on positions that they might not feel comfortable with. But depending on the assignment, I might use an iClicker survey and, and divide people up based on that or based on how they answered a specific question on the blog. So I've tried various things, and it's really assignment dependent. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah. So I teach the general chemistry lab lecture. Yes, I got to get the order right. So one interesting thing about this course, I'm going to talk about the content is, or the context. This is a three credit lab course completely separate from the le lecture course many students are enrolled in. So that alone poses some challenges. Also, it's a big class with lots of students um, who have a lot of different motivations for being in the class. So just to give a little bit of context. Um, so I started out with this, and throughout it, it's kind of gone from the hybrid, blended, flipped terminology. And it is what it is, whichever term you use for this type of class. So you'll see that reflected when students or other instructors talk about what this class is. Um, but we started out with about 20 students in the 2015 summer session. So that was two iterations, 17 to 20 students, um, one instructor, I was the instructor. And then last summer, we had two iterations with two different instructors teaching the same material, but some, uh, they developed their own resources. Sometimes they pulled pre, uh, from previous resources. So it's had four iterations of a nice small class. We now have 65 students. And in the spring, I'm going to have possibly up to 180. It's a very different creature when I have 17 students or 180. And that's been one of the biggest challenges with this course. Um, the things that have made it possible this fall, and I'm hoping really continue to help in the spring, are lead TAs. It basically makes smaller classes, smaller discussion groups, out of a much larger discussion group. Um, and I'm really glad that the previous pre presentation mentioned physical space, because I'm going to talk a little bit about that. How do you deal with trying to do something that the physical space of your classroom is not designed for? So the students in the course have very, very different needs. They're all going to come in and do a lab later in the, in the week, but they need to learn the content or be refreshed on the content. Some of these students are very familiar with the topic. You say acid base, they know the key points in an experiment. Other students have never seen it in the lecture course, or maybe they saw it 10, 15 years ago. So we have very different needs for the lecture portion of this course. It's a required course, mostly non-majors. Their backgrounds in chemistry, their learning styles, their engagement with the course is extremely different student to student. So that's one huge challenge. Um, it, like I said, it's separate from the lecture course. It doesn't uh, track, but also students may be in the first semester, second semester done with the lecture sequence. So I have just a lot of different conversations about chemistry happening in the same classroom. And I think that's a huge asset that we can take advantage of with this sort of format. Some students need refreshers. Others totally know what's happening, um, and others need, oh, really need a lot of practice, and they're very uncomfortable speaking up in class. So this is what Canvas looks like for one module. This is the module, actually, for this week of the course. There's a lot of different stuff in temporal order, you know, in the order that they deal with it. Um, before class, ideally, they're watching 15 to 20 minutes of videos, and those videos are anywhere from one to five minutes long. I really try to keep them short, essentially like chapters, so that they can refresh them. Also, if I want to update them, it's a lot easier for me to update a minute and a half long video. There are simulations. Sometimes it's just a web page where I've curated content, but it's just information I'd like them to look at before the course. There's a pre-class quiz. They can take multiple attempts, does not count towards their grade. I can actually see who's done it before class. Um, and this has been very interesting. Initially, it was a way for me to walk into class and, I guess, talk to the students wherever they were, rather than assuming I knew what the students were going to want to talk about. So it gave me a lot of feedback. In the academic year, I'm starting to find that only about a third of the students are taking that pre-class quiz. So that's added a whole new challenge and a whole new opportunity for the in-class part of this course. They have a bunch of experimental files that support their working in the lab later in the week. 
I always include a feedback survey. It's totally voluntary, totally anonymous, but it gives me a lot of dynamic feedback kind of as I go through the semester, and it's on this module, but also when I look at the course semester to semester, um, what I need to improve. And then I always post my lecture slides. This week's slides were two. It was an introduction and reminders, because a lot of what we do is off of the PowerPoint. Um, and any handout. So this week we actually just had a handout instead of a lecture. OK, so this is, I'm not a big fan of showing students' faces if it's identifiable, so pardon the blurring. Um, but it's the kind of class that I feel like you got to see it. Um, you have to see the physical change that's occurred instead of me standing up and talking kind of like this. Um, what we have is students are in groups. And we have, um, well, let me just show you. So here we have a couple different groups. And the smaller groups, their tables are actually staggered. This lead TA decided to stagger them. Then there's another group over there where I've chosen to kind of keep my group all together. But they're working on problems. This is the lecture course. Um, I use Poll Everywhere a lot. Sometimes, depending on the students and what's happening that week, I do individual and then group problem sets, sometimes just group problem sets. I have given some pop quizzes. The first pop quiz was that pre-class quiz that was available to them, and only a third of the students did. So I printed it out. They did it individually. They did it in a group. Then we did it as a class. We still had a lot of questions after all of those iterations of the same questions. Um, paired group class discussions intermixed with that. So it's a very dynamic, wherever the students are at that point, I feel like I can adapt to that uh, kind of on my feet. Um, and I get to move between groups. I get to adapt to what's happening. So here's another shot of the classroom. We have one, two, three groups, and then lead TAs. So we have three physically separated groups. Within those groups, students are, um, are paired up so that I can have them do individual, paired, larger group discussion or classroom discussions, depending on what we need. There's two lead TAs, each who stick with a group. I have a group, and then I also wander between the groups. Um, there was a question earlier about pairing. I did it randomly. I just gave them a little color on their index card on the first day. They got separated. And then based on discussion with the lead TAs, sometimes we will intentionally pair based on participation to try to get groups talking a little bit more. OK, so the driving force behind this is creating a need for the content. In the summertime, students can't get enough information. They really want to make sure they're prepared. In the academic year, students are extremely busy. This isn't the only course they're taking. And I want to make sure that when they engage with the content, they have a purpose for engaging with that content. It's not just because I said it was important and because I feel that it's relevant to that week. Um, so they can engage with it in many different ways. They can watch videos. The traditional, the biggest comment I get from other instructors is, how will they learn the material? Don't they need to be taught? Well, the traditional teaching is still on video. And it's there to watch as many times as they want to watch it. Um, but in class, that's where I get to really work with that group of students and with whatever they need. So here's two videos. Sometimes I have myself present. I make it as small as possible to still be kind of personable. Um, but sometimes it just starts out with a big definition I want them to be able to reference. Here's an example of a poll everywhere question. And they're actually able to select what their response is. It might be hard to see, but some are selecting the green color. So that gave us a jumping off point for discussion. I could have them discuss it in whatever combination I thought was relevant, and then come back and answer the question again. Here's another example. I like questions that are not straightforward and really stimulate discussion. So here, they're having to select multiple answers that they feel are correct. So you might get one or two, but you may still have questions. And their responses look kind of like this. I can, I can do clou uh, word clouds. I can do different combinations. But once I posted this, and I get to control when this pops up or which responses pop up, then we can see that not everybody agrees. So they can try to convince each other. They can talk about it. They can ask us questions. Um, besides creating a need, I really like to not answer questions, but ask questions. So if they say, how do I answer this problem? Well, what are you thinking about? How are you approaching it? Where might we find it? Hey, we just talked about it over here. I'd like you to teach this other student. So I, I feel like instead of just repeating the content that was already presented to them, I'm now actually facilitating a discussion. And that's been wonderful as an instructor. So the evaluation of this course in terms of improving it, there's a lot of different things I'm looking at. So this is from the summer 2015 evaluation. 
Um, but the thing I want to point out is when looking at this, how to improve it, I'm not just looking at learning outcomes, but how do students react to it? How is this being supported on campus? How is it being supported in my department? How am I reacting to it as the organizer and developer of this course? Um, how do they use the knowledge and skills? Because one big skill is kind of navigating the course. How are they interacting with that new format? Um, what are the instructor reactions and how do they change their teaching as a result of interacting with this format of course? Because now there's been three different instructors in this course. Part of that is also transferability. So initially we saw that students really were watching the videos. Now they're not watching the videos. That's one thing over, over here. This was from summer 2015. Now they're not accessing the pages often, which is where the videos are posted. So here's some quotes. A student. I found the, uh, the portion of the class where we would solve problems as a group immensely helpful in preparation for the test and quizzes. It helped to clarify things we didn't already understand by having to review the material beforehand and doing the problems that applied to these, um, this information ha helped me deepen my understanding of the topics that were being covered. So a student's reaction to this course. One of the other instructors from last summer, um, I think the hybrid course plays a big role in students being able to process information. So I was really encouraged that the focus with both students and the instructor is the process of learning. It was much more thinking about the course, not just thinking about chemistry. So the discussions during the lecture raised to a higher, were raised to a higher level. We were able to delve deeper into the concepts, translates to students being able to answer very challenging questions on their assessments because they truly understand the material. So I was really encouraged by this. The other instructor that taught last summer told me um, that what she learned uh, most from the summer flipped experience was that flipped class does not just mean having the lectures on video. So I think that's something that I've really, I did not quite understand how strong that statement is until I taught this course and developed it. The most crucial part of the flipped classroom is a well-designed class activity that will engage students in meaningful discussion and deepen their understanding of the concepts. So that's been a lot of fun. I've taught this class, the same class, for 14 years. I like this class a lot. But when I stand up and do the same thing every year and say, OK, last year they needed this, so this year I'm going to do this, it just was not, it was not only not interesting, it wasn't getting results. And that's the number one thing, is the students weren't learning what I needed them to learn. Now I feel like I get to class, and I get to react in real time. I get to react week to week. I get to react semester to semester and really be what those students need. And this was in no way possible without CTL, Office of the Provost. Um, the Department of Chemistry has been extremely supportive in this, as well as Dr. Dong Hong Sun and Kinley Granger, who both jumped right in and taught this course. Of course, I developed the materials, but then they adapted it. And now I'm using their adapted materials. So this is really a living, breathing course on pretty much every level I can think of. Um, and students who have provided an immense amount of feedback to improving it, but also sometimes their responses have encouraged me to keep doing it when they say, this is really frustrating, you're not telling me the answer. And that's the most encouragement I can possibly get. <laughs> so. Hi, so um, my name is Mary Ann Price. I'm a lecturer in the Biological Sciences Department. And I'm going to talk to you about using case studies in my general physiology course, um, which I teach in the spring. Um, so general physiology um, is an elective course um, in, in the biology department. Um, it's taken uh, by about 100 to 120 students, um, mostly pre-meds, um, a few pre-dental, um, a few master's students. Um, but mostly juniors and seniors. Um, and it'll come up later. We teach the, the course meets twice a week in the um, Northwest Corner Building in 501. So um, I came to Columbia about a year ago. I had never, this is the first course I taught at Columbia. I had never taught physiology before. Um, I'm not a physiologist by training. My training in signal transduction has a lot of overlap with that, so I'm not completely inexperienced. But um, when I was assigned this course, I was a bit nervous about that. But um, I also knew that I wanted to try some active learning. I had read a lot about this, but I hadn't applied it yet to any of the classes I was teaching. And so I was thinking about what type of active learning. Um, would I use primary research papers 
in the class. This is something that a lot of the uh, upper level biology courses do. Um, would I use problem-based learning? This is also popular, and, and I imagine a lot of the science courses at, at Columbia and other places. Um, and basically, both of those um, require um, you to have, a, um, for the, in the case of the primary research uh, papers, a really good knowledge of the field to know which would be the best papers to use for that purpose. And so that was kind of out for me, at least in the first year. Um, problem-based learning, again, it requires you to have a good body of problems that you can use um, uh, for, for the students to have you know, a meaningful experience. They're challenging, but not too challenging, that sort of thing. So again, I, I didn't really have that prepared for this particular subject area. Um, so what I thought about was using case studies. Um, so for physiology, um, medical case studies are, are, are perfect, basically. Um, there's a lot of cases already available out there. Um, so cases written up in, in medical journals, for example, but also cases at, at the, the National Center um, for Case Studies and Scientific Teaching that are geared more um, to undergraduate level um, or even lower, um, some of them there. Um, there's, and for educational purposes, one of the things I really liked about case studies um, is that they're very good at integrating um, a lot of information. So this is a, basically a pretty standard human physiology course. We go over all the different organ systems. Um, but of course, these organ systems work together um, in, in a functioning human being. Um, and um, the cases are very good at, at bringing all of those topics um, together um, so the students can apply what they've learned um, even in past sections um, of the course. Um, OK, so this, this was the, the method I decided on. But um, oh, and I just wanted to say that everyone's already had a bit of experience doing this before. You probably know this popular TV show, House. Um, and basically, every episode of that show was an interrupted case study. Um, they were usually pretty tricky, and like most of us probably didn't make the correct diagnoses as we watched this. Um, uh, another popular series um, is the Think Like a Doctor series in the New York Times. Um, and those are actually, I actually solve those sometimes. So <laughs> they're, they're a bit more at the level of, um, of, of a student physiologist, basically. Um, OK, so I hadn't had any training in, um, in, in doing case studies with, with students and had never experienced that in, in a class. Um, and I was very lucky um, in that uh, Andrew and Ashley uh, held a, a, a workshop on using case studies um, to enhance teaching last fall. So it was perfect timing um, to get ready for my course. Um, and also, there was the uh, Innovative Teaching Winter Institute um, this January, which wasn't specifically about case studies, um, but we were all meant to bring an assignment. So I brought my first case study as an assignment, and I was assigned to a group within the institute that um, was also working on similar types of assignments. So, um, so that was really good to, to have a chance before actually taking it in the classroom to get some feedback from people who knew what they were doing um, and, uh, and, and to discuss that, that first um, case study in great detail. Um, since then, I've also gone to a conference in case study teaching um, at this na National Center um, uh, for Case Study Teaching in Buffalo. Um, that was in the fall, so uh, not in time for my course last year, but um, I learned a lot there that I'm hoping to apply this year. So I'm nattering on about case studies, and maybe you don't even know what that is. Um, so one definition that we came up with um, at the, um, that conference this fall um, is that it's a story prepared to set up questions for students to discuss and apply what they've learned to a real world situation. Um, and I think probably the, the really um, important parts about this is, uh, or at least um, uh, people proposing this as a way uh, to do teaching is the story part of it, which isn't necessarily obvious, particularly if you're thinking about medical case studies that are written up in journals. They're a bit drier um, and, and very formal. Um, but for the ones written for the classroom, um, they do tend to have a story running throughout them. Um, and then, of course, you, know, you want student discussions um, uh, and with all of these active learning methods. Um, and then also bringing in this real world situation. OK. So there are a lot of different types of case studies, but what I decided on is the interrupted case study method, um, which involves giving the student information um, in chunks. And so they usually start out with a, um, a patient having symptoms, um, and they have to try to come up with a diagnosis and maybe some tests that they would run um, in order to, to differentiate between different um, diagnoses they might have had. Um, and then they work in, in groups um, to discuss 
that information plus any additional information um, that comes after that. And then after each section, we pull the whole classroom together and get um, each of the groups telling us what, what they decided um, amongst their group. So the challenges, um, I, I maybe shouldn't go on about this too much, but um, I had never done this before, so that was a little bit scary. Um, and also, it, you know, the field being new to me as well made it, made it even more intimidating. Um, I think both of the other speakers here today have hit on this. You, if you have a large class, um, this can be difficult to have these group discussions, and particularly if the classroom isn't set up well um, for doing group work. Um, in spite of all of that, um, I decided to do three case studies. So the class, I should have said this sooner, um, is a mostly lecture course. Um, but we had three, uh, three full uh, lecture periods dedicated to these case studies, one for, for each exam. Um, and then I also decided that I, um, probably on the advice of somebody, but I can't remember who now, um, I decided to survey the students after that first case study um, to get some constructive criticism um, from them about how to run the, the two future ones. Um, and that turns out to be really important. They love to have um, um, uh, that, that opportunity um, to take part in their own, um, uh, in, in, the, in the classroom and how it's run. Um, they like being taken seriously, so, uh, in addition to actually giving really good advice. Um, so if you do a search online um, for images and Google about active learning, you see things like this. Um, a bunch of students sitting around a table, sometimes a pretty large group of students, and, and a few of these pictures, um, you can see there's, there's quite a few students, um, but they're in a flat classroom, they've got computers, they, you know, they're talking to each other. Um, so this is my classroom. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have taught there, but um, it's probably the steepest classroom in Columbia. It, it's crazy. The seats are really, the rows of seats are really close together. Um, it's kind of dark in the back, um, which isn't nice for a lot of reasons. But you know, if you're doing group work and the lights are up the whole time, that, the groups that get stuck in back. Um, um, if you have vertigo, this picture is probably making you feel a bit ill right now. Um, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> so, so my biggest problem was trying to figure out how to, how to um, sit the students in groups um, in a way where me and the TAs, um, I was really lucky, I had uh, four TAs for this, this, this class, so um, I had a lot of help. Um, uh, so we wanted to sit the students in a way where we could actually hear what they were saying. We could eavesdrop in on their conversation. So when we pulled things back together, you know, we, we could have an idea or we could help them along if they were stuck or whatever. Um, so, so what we did is we um, um, blocked off a couple of rows where we didn't have any students sitting so we could roam up and down that, that um, row and listen into groups on either side. So we had two rows like, well, almost two rows like that. We couldn't quite fit everyone in, at least until um, uh, sadly, some of the students dropped <laughs> after that, that first case study and exam. Um, <clears throat> so you can see, or maybe you can see, the groups here were seven to nine students, which turned out to be crazy. But for some reason, I thought keeping the group number down was important uh, when I was trying to like get all of you know all their opinions when we pulled everything back together. Um, but yeah, in the end, the number of groups that we had wasn't as important as getting the size right. Um, Right. So the first case uh, was about malignant hyperthermia. Um, it integrates uh, their knowledge of muscle physiology, which we had just covered in class, um, with uh, body temperature homeostasis, which they would have covered in previous classes. And I assigned them a little reading um, uh, assignment in order to refresh their memory on that. Um, and I, I mentioned this idea of a story being important in case study. So this particular case, rather than being narrated from the point of view of a patient, which is often the case, um, it's narrated from the point of view of the niece um, of, of the surgeon um, who is observing him at work as part of her high school biology class. So that was a sort of different thing about this, this first case that we did. Um, so the assignment that they had, so before they came to class, they were supposed to read the first section of the case study um, and to make a, make a diagnosis. Um, so I told them basically, you can search on the internet. Um, you, you aren't gonna be graded on whether your diagnosis is correct. There was no way to tell at that point anyway. I just wanted them to make a stab at it. Um, and then they also had a doc, uh, after they submitted their diagnosis, they had a document to read about malignant hyperthermia. Um, and then during class, um, there were three additional sections of the case study, which they discussed in groups. Um, and they, there were usually three to five questions at the end of each of those, um, those sections um, uh, that they discussed with their group and that we also discussed as a, as a full class. 
Um, and then finally, at the end of class, for um, uh, a grade together with the, um, uh, the initial assignment here, um, they had to write up answers for uh, about 10 questions um, on the case. So, so we ran the first um, case study. I think Andrew was there at, at, at that one. Um, I was, went into it expecting it to be completely chaotic, and it was. Um, but the buzz in the room was just amazing. Um, I just loved hearing the students have, have um, all of the discussions that they were having. Um, we, we did get feedback from them. Um, the main one um, that we really needed to, to adopt was having smaller groups so that they could more easily hear everybody else in the group. Um, uh, they felt like the questions were too repetitious and that there was too much material to read. So something that I learned from this is that you really have to, to go in, even though these cases that are up at, um, on the database at the, um, at the center in Buffalo, um, they've been peer reviewed. Um, oftentimes you need to go in and do a bit of surgery on them, <laughs> take, take some sections out if, or take questions out if they're not needed. Um, yeah, they didn't like having a bunch of different pieces of paper. And so for the next case study, I actually gave them the whole case at one time. And that actually turned out to be a big mistake. You shouldn't always take their advice. <laughs> it's an interrupted case study. They're meant to get the information um, uh, piecemeal um, as you go along. And it's just too easy to, to cheat otherwise. So. Um, I also had advice from Andrew, who attended, um, and that was about planning um, what you're going to do when you pull the class back together and making sure that, that you've got everyone on the, on the same page. So we heard a bit about audience response systems earlier, and that's something I'm considering um, adopting in the future um, uh, to, to make sure that, that people, that everyone is, is understanding what's going on. Um, so my recommendation to you, if you want to try this in your classroom, don't be afraid to try it. Um, the students, um, I, I wish I'd had some quotes, um, uh, almost unanimously loved it. Um, and they didn't really love very much else about the course. So um, this was the one, the one uh, positive um, thing that, that, that uh, came out of their evaluations. Um, do ask the CTL for advice. They give really great advice. They were incredibly helpful um, for, for running this. Um, for a complete novice like myself, but I'm sure they have great advice for everyone. Um, we always did a trial run with me and the TAs before we actually took it to the classroom, um, and that was really useful um, in terms of modifying it and getting it ready for the students, but then also the, the TAs um, were more informed as they went around listening in on these conversations to um, help the students along. Um, and. Um, yeah, asking for feedback from the students, I think, was, um, was really important. Um, uh, they like to, to be able to contribute um, in that way, and plus they have really good ideas about how to do things better. That's basically it. Thank you. So three great presentations. Thank you so much to all three faculty for making the time. Um, and I also want to remind you that each one of these faculty members worked with a le learning designer to help uh, work on their, uh, you know, on their blend. So uh, we do have a website where if you want to reach out and connect with learning designers uh, to help you think about blending, this is the link. And we have, a, and really the other thing to know is that each one of these learning designers, many of them are here, help put together the required series. So all of the workshops are really the product of a, of a community with faculty and learning designers working together thinking about how to blend the course, and coming up with great examples to share with others in the Columbia context. So I just want to remind you, you know, when we're thinking about blended learning, all of these examples showed this idea that there is some kind of learning that's happening online, <clears throat> and there's some uh, adaption to the time, the pace, the, the path, or the, or the place. So in many cases, if you look at a lot of these, a lot of these um, case studies that we heard today, there's also some kind of learning that's happening in class. And it's really the connection between what's happening online and in class that's making that blend happen, right? So we're going to come up with a, you know, a, a schedule for the spring. We're going to have some new topics. Uh, I'm going to work with uh, learning designers who I've worked with various faculty on campus to come up with another set of uh, workshops to address some other uh, interesting aspects of blended learning that might be worth thinking about for your course. Um, I also encourage you until then to check out our website. We have some great programs in store, institutes and other types of um, orientations that you may want to check out uh, during the winter break and in, in the beginning of the spring. 
Uh, our rewired series will also return there. Um, if you're interested, all of the slides from all of the sessions are available on the rewired website. Uh, we will also put the video for this session on the rewired website as well, and that's the link. Um, and last but not least, we have some awards for people who, <coughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of cold, for people who have attended four or more sessions. So that ends our session, but if your name is up here and you want to come up and get your mug and your award, uh, thank you for coming. Don't forget to put your name on the attendance form and also fill out an evaluation sheet. Thank you. <laughs>